Malcolm Tarling from the Association of British Insurers. Interesting angle that. Just check you there. Malcolm, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Yes, I am, Nicky. Hello. I'll be, with, I'll be with you. Hi. Uh, first, though, joined by Julia uh, Lobu Syed, who is Chief Executive of Advantage Travel Partnerships, the UK's largest consortium of independent travel agents, member of the UK's Global Task Force, a group that makes recommendations to the government on a possible pathway back to international travel. So, um, Julia, good morning to you. How are you doing? The, the Prime Minister's playing down expectations. Rachel was talking about the green, amber and red list. He's playing down expectations that a significant number of destinations will be on the green list on May the 17th. What do you think about what's coming down the line? Uh, well, good morning, Nick. Here. Um, I, I think the reality is that none of us in the industry are really expecting a, a very long list of countries that are, will effectively be in, in what you describe as the green list. Um, and, and a cautious approach has always been something that we accept, expected. So um, we're not expecting long lists and certainly expecting for the foreseeable future. Well, certainly as, as we reopen on the 17th, as you said, just for England, that there will be fewer countries on that list. But it's it's also worth mentioning that it's green. It's not green in, in the sense of what we normally associate a traffic light to be. Um, green does have shades of red and anyone travelling back from a green country will have to present a negative PCR test um, back in the UK, which has to be pre-booked before you travel. So that's one of the things that you have to show when you went, re-enter the country. So green is not quite green. It is green with um, bits of red in there as well. Yeah, up to 200 quid a pop as well for each individual. So that yeah. is prohibitive for uh, many people. What about what we heard from Leila Moran there about the potential chaos at the airport? Um, I was just looking through the um, the report that came out of Select Committee, Transport Select Committee, on the back of the Global Travel Task Force um, report. And actually, they very made it very clear that they're, they're looking at the government and expecting the government to ensure that those queues are not there, that they put in place recommendations to bring those queues down. Um, from what I understand, you know, the queues really are around the lack of border force staff, which obviously are not employed by the airport, um, but also the paperwork that needs to be checked, the physical paperwork that needs to be checked upon arrival. So um, digitalisation, you know, ensuring that the government is working in collaboration with their international counterparts to ensure there is a seamless approach at the border will, will help bring those queues down. Of course, the EU have uh, made this announcement that uh, they want to encourage travel. Their countries within the European Union need that travel industry, vital to those economies. But uh, they're saying people should be able to travel to EU countries uh, if they come from... Uh, countries with strong vaccination campaigns and low infection rates as well. But the list of, um, as you say, it's not green as we know it, <laughs> but the list of those countries could well expand to include uh, Portugal, Spain and Greece, possibly from early to mid-summer. That will mean an awful lot to a lot of people, won't it? It will. And I think it's easy to, to, to be very judgmental on, on if we take just holidays for a moment and, and just put aside friends and family and businesses that rely on travel and tourism. It's not just about the end destination. I mean, the UK employs a million people that are that are employed within the, the UK travel industry. So it's really critical that those destinations that are really important for the UK are opened up in a safe manner as quickly as possible. And one of the things that we're focused on is actually being really clear about the end destination and the experience in destination. And, and actually, let's not forget the mitigation strategies that a lot of these um, destinations, but also the whole ecosystem from the airport to the flight to the hotel are putting in mm -hmm. place to make sure they can reopen really safely. Mm. But people on both sides of the commons and others and epidemiologists and virologists and otherologists are saying... This is foolish. An hour ago, we spoke to Eleanor Gaunt, who is a virologist at Edinburgh University's Roslyn Institute, the famous There's Roslyn Institute. If the restrictions are eased on the current timetable, we're going to see around another 20,000 um, deaths from coronavirus. And there are very simple steps that we can take to avoid that situation. And one of those is, is restricting foreign travel. That's sobering, isn't it? Very. I mean, I, I you know, I didn't realise we had so many virologists, to be, to be honest with you, and it's fantastic, and we're so fortunate to have um, such, you know, world-class scientists. But I have to say, um, international travel has been practically ground to halt for the last 14 months. There is a point at which, you know, we need to reopen, and we cannot 
um, continue this fear mongering, scaremongering. We have never, from my understanding, you know, the government has never taken a no risk approach. We have to reopen. We have to open safely. But there is a point in time at which through the framework that's been created, you know, in terms of the traffic light system, um, as a case in point, when we start to reopen slowly, um, the government is built in review periods so they can review. And, and it's always based on data. Um, but there is a point at which we, we have to start getting on with our lives in a safe manner, following the science um, and without lots of, um, you know, lo lots of scaremongering, fear mongering that unfortunately we're all we're all, you know, we're all I I engulfed in right now. Um, I think I think the other point also is at, at what point is the is the right what is the right balance of risk approach and who is it to determine that? Um, I mean, I've I've worked with the Global Travel Task Force. I've been involved in some of the meetings, um, mm -hmm. and actually, even you know, the, the great thing there is you've got a, you know lots of different um, experts all coming together to, for the common good. Um, however, the report goes away, and you're not then not involved in coming back with a recommendation. So. One of the things that the industry really, really wants is to make sure they're working really closely with government to ensure that we can do exactly this and it is open up safely, mitigating risk and be part of the process all the way through. Different voices from government, different thoughts and, and nuances and also from the scientific uh, communities. That was modelling and, uh, you know, one person's fear mongering is another person's measured scientific modelling. So that uh, conversation goes on. I just wonder, we've got Malcolm Tarling, as I'm mentioned uh talking about the insurance uh situation i just i just wonder if you've got anything you would want to ask uh, malcolm from the association of british insurers julia from uh, your point of view yeah you know, I, th I think the um morning malcolm i, I think the, the whole the whole process for international travel and we we focus today on you know the scientific advice and on the traffic light system but it is so incredibly complex and there are so many other parts of the jigsaw that need to align together such as fcdo advice which i'm sure malcolm will know a lot about um you know we need we need to make sure the fcdo advice is aligned to the traffic light system because otherwise we'll have we'll stand to risk of having countries in a green traffic light setting but it's not aligned with the FCDO advice, which then means your insurance won't cover you. Um, and the FCDO advice pre-COVID was there to, um, as a travel advisory, um, not actually against mutations and variants, but it was there to, to obviously ensure and, and guard against um, putting in place advice for consumers traveling um, against other measures. So we've, we're now in this in this melting pot where it, it, FCDO advice was a was a blanket travel advisory. Um, and if you go against FCD advice when you're traveling, your insurance won't cover you. So, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd really love to hear Malcolm's view on that and, and whether he's been involved in any discussions to ensure that that can align and what consumers should be looking out for. Yes. Uh, thank you, Julia. Yeah, it is a complex picture. It is a, a rapidly changing picture, as we know. And you're absolutely right. If you travel against government advice, you are likely to find that your policy, your travel policy is going to be null and void. As far as travel insurance is con are concerned, um, they will expect you to be complying with the government requirements um, from the, the green, amber and the red traffic lights um, and providing that you are doing so and providing that you are not travelling against government advice and that's why the two have to be aligned, that's crucial as Julia said, then your travel insurance will operate in the normal way. I would say that travel insurance is not designed to cover you if you incur additional costs if you fall foul of the government restrictions. So for example, if you come back to the UK uh, from a red zone country and you have to quarantine for 10 days and you're losing income travel insurance is not designed and crucially not priced to cover those losses what it's designed and priced to cover is that if you travel abroad and you need emergency medical treatment then it is there to pick up the bill that is the primary pur purpose of, of of travel insurance and and only last year we saw a case of a customer who traveled to europe he's one of the few customers i think that probably did travel to, to europe Europe um, when it was safe to do so and he fell out, he had suffered a fall in Spain he had to have medical treatment and he needs an emergency air ambulance back to the UK and the bill for that was 124,000 pounds so that's one case study that shows why once traveling resumes in whatever form it does to Europe and beyond that travel insurance for people is going to be as essential as it ever was. 
Wow, what a bell. So just finally, these things can turn on as sixpence. What if a new variant emerges, rears its extremely ugly head very, very quickly, and somebody's just got out there and thinks, well, you know, if this, this, this new, this country has become on the red list all of a sudden, and I'm going to stick it out here just for a few days before I come home, but then I will have to pay for quarantine at a government-approved hotel. What would the insurance policy be in that scenario? And there will be many more scenarios. There will be many more scenarios that will be tested, I'm sure, in the coming months. In that scenario, your travel insurance is uh, unlikely to cover you for quarantine if the um, the, the traffic the light changes. system changes while you're over there. But if you are over there and um, the worst happens and you suffer the COVID COVID-related uh, illness, then your travel insurance should operate in the normal way. So travel insurance are not going to leave you in the lurch. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, useful and informative. That's what we do. And that's what you both did, Julia and Malcolm. It's 7.30.